Welcome to Long Covid Doctor, an educational series for sufferers of Long Covid. I'm Dr Tim Robinson, formerly a GP for 30 years, now GP lead for three NHS Long Covid clinics and a GP clinical lead in Long Covid across the southwest of England. This is on this episode is on dysautonomia and long covid. In part 1, I talk about the symptoms, the diagnosis, investigations and causes. And in part 2, I will talk about the treatments, the management and the outcomes. References, links and resources are in the show notes below. And any advice and diagnoses and treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own GP or your qualified health provider. So here we go, dysautonomia and long COVID. So firstly, the context, the background, dysautonomia. Dysautonomia is common in long COVID. It Certainly in my experience in the three long COVID clinics I work in, it is an extremely common problem, presenting itself in many different ways and having a significant effect on um, those patients. So, what is dysautonomia? For most of us, dysautonomia was a new word, uh, a new condition before COVID or long COVID uh, came along. But as I said, what is it? Let's take the word apart, dysautonomia. Dis, as in that's short for dysfunctional. Uh, autonomia, short for autonomic. Autonomic is taken from autonomic nervous system. So this word, um, dysautonomia, is a dif- dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And so in order to understand dysautonomia, we first have to understand what the autonomic nervous system is and what it does. The autonomic nervous system is basically the body's main control system that regulates bodily functions that are not under our conscious voluntary control. Those functions that we don't have to think about normally, okay, that happen without us knowing. The autonomic nervous system is extremely complicated and complex. It's made up of five different parts the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, the enteric, the HPA and the limbic system. So each in turn, sympathetic nervous system, the flight and fight system, the adrenaline system. I'm sure you've all heard of that. The second is the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system, so called the vagal system. Then there's the enteric nervous system, the gastrointestinal tract nervous system um, for gut secretions, enzyme secretions and motility or peristalsis, movement of the gut, movement of the contents of the gut down. And then HPA that stands for hypothalamus pituitary adrenal, adrenal axis, okay, HPA axis, which is all to do with the brain and body for emotions and stress. And then there's the limbic system, the hippocampus for short-term memory, the amygdala for fear, emotion and stress. And then there's the prefrontal cortex for executive functions like decision making. There are a number of other um, sections of the limbic system, but those are the most important and most relevant in this long COVID setting. So what does the all autonomic nervous system do? Now you know what it is, what does it do? What does it control? In order to answer that, let's think of all the systems of the body. So first of all, the cardiovascular system, both centrally and peripherally, okay, Um, to control heart rate, uh, heart rate and pulse and blood pressure, and also the peripheral blood vessels, the the blood vessels in the hands, feet, in the skin. Then there's the respiratory system. The autonomic nervous system controls the rate and depth of breathing. 
and then there's the balance and systems to control um, the autonomic nervous system controls balance and coordination and then there's the temperature and control system thermoregulation um, so the autonomic nervous system controls the superficial skin surface blood vessels they open up when we want to lose heat they close when we want to conserve heat um, there's the gastrointestinal system like i said that the autonomic nervous system um, controls the enzyme secretion and also the gut motility the movement of the gut the contracting contracting and relaxing of the gut muscle and above and above all, and beyond all of those there are a, a number of other systems that are controlled by the autonomic nervous system thirst and bladder and bowel control and eye reflexes and sleep so you know basically it's complicated and it has so many functions like i said those functions that we don't normally think about and they happen automatically and so if the autonomic nervous system is disturbed or disrupted dysregulated and becomes dysfunctional those systems don't work normally do they uh, this leads to symptoms in all of those systems these are the symptoms of dysautonomia and these are palpitations palpitations the the, the feeling of the sensation that you can feel your heart beating in your chest for no reason whilst you're resting whilst you're asleep um, waking in the middle of the night um, with your heart racing or palpitations upon standing from sitting or lying um, just um, the heart racing after you've sat, stood up from the sitting position and you are standing and even after three four five six ten minutes the heart is still racing with palpitations this is also known as POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome so more on that a little later what other symptoms are there to do with dysautonomia well thinking of the systems again respiratory system breathlessness it contributes to the breathlessness of long covid the balance system remember so patients with dysautonomia often present with dizziness and unsteadiness um, linked to that is tinnitus ringing in the ears and it's probably something to do with the vestibular nerve the nerve that um, uh, that is linked with um, balance and the auditory nerve which is linked with sound and also linked to this is nausea um, and this is probably due to the effect of um, on the trigger on the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the brainstem uh, moving on now to the gut system so symptoms of dysautonomia indigestion very common irritable bowel syndrome type picture um, an alteration of the bowel function usually loose semi-form loose motions or even indigestion and then disruption of the temperature control system and so patients with dysautonomia often complain of shivering and just can't get warm icy cold or conversely they can be permanently hot flushing patients female patients say you know is this my menopause come early um besides all that you know yet more uh, dysautonomic symptoms to do with the limbic system so increased sensitivity of smell taste and hearing um, um, uh, effects on the gut brain axis due to reduced um, formation of the neurotransmitter serotonin um, effects on the pineal gland and the and the link with the hypothalamus so the pineal gland again we'll come on to this a bit later um, and uh, it, the pineal gland secretes melatonin so this is lost therefore melatonin being the natural um, if you like hormone which has sedating effects is 
is reduced and therefore that leads to sleep disruption. Pain centres can be affected in dysautonomia, so patients for some reason, other no reason other than a long COVID dysautonomia, they get headaches, which is a new thing, or they get worsening of their pre-existing migraines. And to top it all off, um, there's a crossover between dysautonomia and mast cell activation. Remembering what that is, um, again, I've, I've done a talk on that, um, last long COVID and MCAS, mast cell activation, symptoms such as the skin, hives, respiratory secretions, gastrointestinal symptoms of sort of um, indigestion, poor swallow, diarrhea. There's, it's just that there seems to be a crossover of those symptoms. There seems to be a merging of those two, two conditions, dysautonomia and mast cell activation, and they share many of their symptoms. So, there we are. The list is long. Um, the list of all the possible symptoms um, that someone with dysautonomia can experience. So one one individual patient may just have one or two of those symptoms, or three or four, or all of them. That is certainly my experience of patients in our long COVID clinics. It's complicated. The effects are often devastating. And so what is the cause of dysautonomia? Why does it happen? Why does it occur? What is, as we call it in medical speak, the pathophysiology? What's the pathology behind dysautonomia? And why does, why does the autonomic nervous system become dysfunctional or get out of control? Well, basically, it must be something to do to the tissues of the autonomic nervous system, the nerves, their fibres, the cell bodies, both around the body, but also in the brain, um, that have become affected by the COVID viral infection. So let's just remind ourselves what they are, what effects that the COVID has had on, on the body systems. Basically, there's the direct effect of the virus on the brain, there's the effect of excessive inflammation on the brain. There's the effect of autoantibodies to the brain tissues. They've been, dis they've been identified and isolated, um, both so that is not only in the brain, but also in the peripheral nerves um, and also in the what's known as the baroreceptors in the carotid bodies and the aortic arch and the sinoatrial node those all control, wait for it, the heart rate. Um, and then there are the effects of microclots on the brain um, and throughout the body. But in this context, the dysautonomia context, those microclots, um, if they should f um, collect and form in the brainstem due to this excessive inflammatory response, will be a major contributor to dysautonomia. And so there we are. There are numerous mechanisms at play in long COVID. And like I said before, any one individual patient may have one, some or all of those pathological processes, those causes for, for long COVID. But the net effect is autonomic nervous system dysfunction, dysautonomia. Um, so how do we diagnose dysautonomia? Basically, the diagnosis is mostly based on clinical suspicion, on the symptoms. Uh, symptoms that would make me suspect dysautonomia in a patient are palpitations, um, especially if they're when the patient goes from lying to standing. Um, uh, that condition, remember, as I said earlier, was is the condition known as POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Other con other symptoms that would make me suspicious of a patient having dysautonomia would, would be lightheadedness, unsteadiness, giddiness, a faint feeling. Um, other common associated symptoms are um, patients going cold and clammy, nausea, sick feeling for no reason, um, ringing in the ears, tinnitus, 
and any of the other symptoms of dysautonomia. And remember, there's that crossover of symptoms with mast cell activation. So if someone has skin hives or respiratory secretions or gastric problems, which are very suggestive of mast cell activation, I would also be on my lookout for dysautonomia. And so, um, to sum up, there is no real clear-cut, tight diagnostic label for dysautonomia based on biomarkers or measurable parameters. The diagnosis is usually what we call a clinical diagnosis based on the story. Um, however, having said that, some of the symptoms may need further exploring, and so it's on to the examination and investigations. So the cardiovascular symptoms, for example, if the patient has palpitations or their blood pressure seems to be dropping inappropriately, we need a cardiological workup, obviously. We want to make sure that the heart and circulation are actually functioning normally. There's no other cause for those those um, symptoms of palpitations or blood pressure drop. So we would be we wanting to do blood tests, of course, or chest X-ray and an ECG to ensure that we're not missing anything. Likewise, neurological symptoms that uh, appear in with their dysautonomic picture. So new onset headaches or vertigo or, or nausea. Likewise, bowel symptoms, particularly bowel changes. We, you know, all these need to need to be considered, and further testing and and red flags to be excluded and ruled out. That may even lead to referral on to a specialist. Just as an aside, there is one dysautonomic condition uh, that we call that we can diagnose for exam by examination, and that is POTS. I keep mentioning this POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, when the pulse races upon standing from sitting or prolonged standing. Um, this is formally diagnosed by a tilt table test, but these are quite difficult tests to come by. Uh, instead, you can do the NASA lean test or a 10 minute active stand test, um, in which the pulse is recorded whilst the patient is lying flat. And then again, when the patient has been standing for 10 minutes, the patient has POTS if the pulse increases by more than 30 beats per minute. Um, the difference between the pulse when they're lying and the pulse when they've been standing for 10 minutes. This is important to diagnose because there are treatments for this, but more on this in my talk on long COVID POTS. And so, as I said, on the whole, the diagnosis of dysautonomia is usually what we call a clinical diagnosis, a diagnosis based on the symptoms and the history, having ruled out other diagnoses, serious and less serious. And so that brings me to the end of the first part of my talk on dysautonomia. In the second part, I'll talk about treatment, management and outcomes. So I hope that's been helpful. As I mentioned at the start, any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own GP or qualified health professional. So in the meantime, I wish you well. I wish you well with your long COVID recovery and hopefully see you in part two. Cheerio.